an unfair fight. Job 4, 1 to 11, and 6, 1 to 9. A few months ago, you lost your wife, and you're grieving. Your friends try to comfort you by saying, Your wife was lovely, but she's gone. You're young. You should date. Dry your tears. Or, you know, you're sick. You're not better even though you've prayed. And your friend says to you, You didn't pray hard enough, or else you'd have been healed. Have more faith. Don't be so miserable. <laughs> you know, with uh, friends like this, who needs enemies? There are friends who try to comfort you, but they don't. It's one thing if God's word and, and uh, their challenges come from God's word, but it's another thing when they're using their own wisdom. When Job lost his family, farm, and flesh, his three friends came to comfort him, but instead of comforting him, you know, they tried to correct him. They thought by correcting him that he would be comforted. One could say that they had good intentions. Uh, unfortunately, um, when they heard his complaints, they became angry. And they wanted to honor and defend God, which is good in one sense, but they forgot his need. And so they rebuked him. They took turns rebuking him. So this was, you could say, a fight. But it was, unfortunately, an unfair fight. It was like tag team wrestling. You know, each team has multiple wrestlers. And when a wrestler is tired, he can tag his team, uh, his teammate, in order to swap places. So while his friends uh, took turns rebuking him, they had a tag team. Job, unfortunately did not have any rest. So today we want to look at their wisdom and Job's responses. Now we're squeezing many chapters into one message, but I think it's fruitful because it helps us to understand their accusation. It helps us to see ourselves in them and to understand Job's struggles. There are three points. Firstly, their unrelenting punches. Secondly, his painful wounds. And thirdly, his confident perseverance. So firstly, there are punches. Now, what kind of fighters were they? What were their fighting styles, if you, if, if you would? Now, Eliphaz was a sanctimonious man. He had a holier-than-thou attitude. He was likely to be the oldest because he spoke first. He probably thought it was his responsibility to help Job. And so let's see his punches. What kind of punches did he throw? So the first punch was, uh, practice what you preach. In Job chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, Eliphaz essentially says these words. Uh, this is my translation. Um, and he said, Job, I, I hope you won't be hurt when I say these things. But after hearing you, I really have to speak up and share my thoughts. Because in the past, you encouraged and strengthened people. You supported them. But now, when trouble comes to you... You faint. You're terrified. <laughs> you know, with friends like these, who needs enemies? So Eliphaz essentially was saying this. Job, you should practice what you preach. In the past, you helped people. You strengthened them. So how dare you complain now? Follow your own advice. Pick yourself up. Why are you fainting? Second punch. Job, you must be wicked because only the wicked suffer. In verses 7 to 11, he says to the effect that innocent people are not cut off, they don't suffer. He says, you know, my words here, In all my years, I've only seen the wicked suffer. Even the most wicked and the strongest, like lions, God will eventually break their teeth. So what's the translation here? In other words, Eliphaz was saying that Job must have been wicked. But not only that, the words that he spoke here had even worse implications. Because who were the ones who died violently? Who were the ones who, quote-unquote, had their teeth broken? It was Job's children. They died violently. They were cut off because the roof fell on them. And Eliphaz said in verse 7 that the righteous are not cut off before their time. 
In other words, Job's children, they died young. They were cut off before their time. In other words, they were not innocent. They were wicked. And this was also an insult to Job because Job was so concerned for his children before by offering them sacrifices, by offering God sacrifices for them. So the implication here is that Job had failed them because his sacrifices were useless. The third punch, you're a sinner in danger of judgment. You know, Job 5, 1 to 2, Eliphaz said, Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. Eliphaz here was trying to accuse Job and say to Job that Job was an angry man and that anger kills the fool. You see, Eliphaz had seen Job's grief and his great crying. Why? And as a result, he saw that grief and that anger and he called Job a fool. Now, in the Bible, a fool is not someone who is... Um, uneducated or dumb or whatever, but a fool in Bible speak is someone who is sinful. In other words, Eliphaz was accusing Job of sin, of such a sin that would result in judgment. So Eliphaz here was a sanctimonious man. He had a holier-than-thou attitude, but here he tagged out and Bildad tagged in. Now, Bildad was a traditional man. That's probably the best word that I can use to describe him. He was someone who was very traditional. He believed in karma. You know, he believed that if you do something good, you'll be rewarded. If you do something bad, you will be punished. And he essentially said that if you've had tragedy in your life, it's because you deserved it. Bildad also delivered three punches. So the first punch, and here we're jumping to Job chapter 8. We haven't read it, but I hope you will read these passages. In Job chapter 8, uh, uh, Bildad essentially said, you got what you deserve. In verses 3 and 4, Bildad told Job that God does not pervert justice. He does not twist justice. So if Job's children died, it's because they sinned. It's because they deserved it. See, Job had maintained all along that he did not deserve what came to him and that God must be unfair, that he, he, he must not, you know, be, uh, you know, a, a good judge. He must be unfair. And... As bad as that sounds, and it is bad, uh, Bildad got angry that Job could even think this. Now, Job was thinking this because he thought, what have I done to deserve this? And of course, uh, Eliphaz said, you sin. Job said, I didn't sin. If what you say is correct, then God must be unjust. So Bildad chimed in and said, no. You're wrong. God is always just. He is always fair. He gives people what they deserve. You know, Noah's generation was wicked. The flood killed them. Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked. The fire killed them. Your children were wicked. That's why the roof killed them. They deserved it. Whatever, what other proof do you need? Do good and you'll be rewarded. Do evil and you'll be punished. That's karma. That's a traditionalist way of looking at judgment. Now, the second punch. Job, everyone believes in karma. It's an ancient philosophy. If you reject this teaching, then you are foolish. Job 8, 8 to 10. Job 8, 8 to 10. Again, my translation. Just ask the previous generation. Pay attention to the experience of our ancestors. You and I haven't been alive very long, and so we know nothing. But those who came before us, they will teach you the old wisdom. If you won't hear about karma from me, hear about karma from them. 
And after Bildad says this, he proceeds to quote some of that old wisdom. In Proverbs 8, 11 to 13, he quoted an ancient proverb, not a biblical proverb, but an ancient proverb of those days uh, in the land of Uz. And here in verses 11 to 13, he talks about a papyrus plant. uh, And a papyrus plant only grows when there's water. The translation is simple, isn't it? Job, your children died because God withdrew his blessings. He did not water them, all right? They were sinful. In Job 8, 16 to 22, he quoted another proverb. Weeds also grow strong under the sun until the gardener comes. So what's the implication here? You know, Job was very rich. His children enjoyed their life. And so Bildad was saying that Job enjoyed and flourished for a time. He was rich with many children, but eventually God the gardener came and pulled him out and pulled them out like the weeds they were because his suffering was proof. Punch number three, admit your sin and all will be well. In Job 9, 5 to 7, Bildad told Job to pray to God. If you live honestly, if you repent, then God will restore you to your happy times. You'll have your happy home back again. Just confess. Now, Bildad and Eliphaz were not very different here. Both had judged Job. Because of all these terrible things that happened, Job must therefore be at fault, and he was being punished. And to them, because he was being punished due to all of these sufferings, the solution is very simple. All he had to do was repent. So Bildad was pressuring Job to make a dishonest confession. It's kind of like North Korea, you know? Uh, When the regime there captures people, They will torture them until they make a false confession just so that they can be released. But Job here would not make this false confession. Now, it's not to say that Job did not recognize himself as a sinner. He did. He had frequently said that he was a sinner, but he would not confess to the sins that they accused him of. You know, he could have said, confess, you say? But confess what? Right? Uh, It's not as if Job denied that he was a sinner. He admitted he was a sinner, but not, he did not commit the sins that they had accused him of committing. So Eliphaz, sanctimonious man, holier than thou, delivered three punches. Bildad, the traditional karma man, also delivered three punches. And now he tagged out, and the one who tagged in was so far, and so far was so far the most vicious one of them all. He was not just a sanctimonious man, not just a traditional karma man, but he combined those two and he was a vicious man. Now he spoke last, which means that he was likely the youngest. He had heard all of his friends' rebukes towards Job, And he had also heard of all Job's insistence that he was not guilty of what he was accused of. And so now Zophar felt it was his responsibility to deliver the strongest punches of all. So what were these punches? The first punch was this. Job, you're a liar. Take a look at Job 11, 2-4. Zophar effectively says this in these three verses. You know, Job, you've responded to what these friends have said, and I cannot let you get away with your lies. How can a man who lies and mocks God not be rebuked? You've lied by saying that you've done nothing wrong before God. Now, it's not true that Job said he never sinned. Job always admitted he was a sinner. 
But Job asks, what were the great sins he committed to deserve such suffering? Even though Job admitted to sin, it, it wasn't enough for Zophar. Zophar wanted him to admit that he deserved the suffering, that he was a greater sinner than what he claimed to be. You know, to some people, you can never do right. You'll always be wrong. You can never win <laughs> with them. And sometimes we parents are like that. You know, we, we berate and berate our children. We scold and scold them. And when they finally admit they're wrong, we say, you must mean it from your heart. And yes, sometimes it's, it's true. Parents may be right, but at other times, parents can also behave like um, uh, mistrunchable, you know, from uh, Roald Dahl's book, Matilda, you know, where, you know, she said, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm big, you're small. There's nothing you can do about it, All right? It, you know, very often it can be like that. So to Zophar, he was like the mistrunchable. Job was always wrong. Nothing he did could ever be right, and nothing he did could change Zophar's mind. After saying this, Zophar delivered the second punch, and this was really the harshest one. In Job 11, 5 to 6, he essentially said that Job deserved far worse than what he actually got. The fact that Job lost his farm, his family, his flesh, bad, but not bad enough. Let me read verses 5 to 6, Job 11. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, and that he would show thee the secrets of his wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. In other words, Job, if you really knew the truth, you got far less than what you deserve. So even though Job lost his farm, his family, his flesh, he should have lost more according to so far. You know, again, I say with friends like this, you know, who needs enemies? So after this, Zophar delivers the third punch. Job, you'll never understand. Bildad and Eliphaz and I have spoken to you. You're hopeless. You know, you, you'll never get what we're saying. You know, Job, you have as much uh, hope of changing as a donkey gives birth to a man. Verse 12, he says, For vain man would be wise, Though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Now that's in our grand old translation. Now let me quote from other versions that make this a bit clearer. Verse 12 of chapter 11. The New King James says, An empty-headed man will be wise when a wild donkey's colt is born a man. That's pretty clear, but the NASB has it a lot clearer. <laughs> it says, An idiot will become intelligent when the foal of a wild donkey is born a man. In other words, Job, you will only understand what we are saying. You will only understand that you are wrong when pigs fly. You'll only get it when hell freezes over, when the sun rises from the west, when horses grow horns, when the lions win the World Cup. Okay, <laughs> that was below the belt, but you get what I mean. So here, now that the friends um, have given these punches, in the subsequent chapters, they continue to argue and to fight with him. Uh, the rounds of fights are not ended. They will continue to scold him. But the in, in the interest of time, I won't cover those chapters. You know, what they say is essentially more of the same things with little differences here and there. And so I'd encourage you to read chapters 12 onwards up to 19. But now we want to focus on Job's response. Now each time they punched him and they scolded him and they rebuked him, Job always gave his responses and he expressed his grief. So we see, secondly, the wounds of a downed man. How did Job feel? How did he feel? Well, if you were Job, how would you feel? 
he felt hurt, and he told them so. Job 6, 1-2 But Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances together. In other words, if only you could weigh my sadness and put my misery on the scale. You know, Job was so sorrowful that he wanted to die. Verses 8 to 9. He was so sad because his friends showed him no pity whatsoever. And in Job 6, 14 to 15, he wept. He, he, he said that pity should be shown to the one suffering. But these brothers, these three men, were like dry streams in the desert. They were a disappointment. You know, in those days, people in caravans would travel through the desert and they would greatly anticipate that if they came to a desert stream, that it would be flowing with water. But if they came to a desert stream and it was dry, uh, they would be disappointed. So how Job regarded his friends is that if they came to him, they should be comforting him. But they were not comforting him. They were showing him no pity at all. And so he was hurt. He was disappointed. His friends were no friends at all. And, and Job was not only hurt emotionally, he was hurt physically. Job 7, 4-5, it says, when I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be gone? And I'm full of tossings to and fro unto the dawning of the day. My flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. You see, at this point in time, Job could not sleep. You know, he had insomnia, probably because of the pain that's in his body. And he was probably asking, when is morning coming? He tossed all night because, you know, his, his skin had become loathsome. It had probably burst open the boils and it was attracting maggots, you know, the worms. And, and, but his friends were still unsympathetic. Now, secondly, not only was he hurt, but Job was at a loss. He felt forsaken. His friends were no friends, and God seemed not to have answered him. And Job really wanted an answer at this point in time. In Job 9, he wanted to speak to God, to ask God why these things had happened to him. He wanted an answer. I mean, when we go through difficulties, don't we want answers from God? We do, don't we? And he had asked God, but there was no answer. You know, in verse 2, uh, he wanted God to declare that he was innocent because his friends were attacking him. Uh, in verse 3, uh, he wanted God to answer him. And this is all in Job chapter 9, all right? And in verse 15, he wanted to approach God for a judgment, you know, we all have a right to a speedy trial. Uh, maybe that's only an American thing, I'm not sure. You know, uh, but everyone has a right to a, a, a speedy trial, that it does not drag on, that you're not held in prison uh, for too long. Um, and so he wanted this judgment. And in verse 19 of chapter 9, he wanted to plead his case uh, with God. And of course, Job knew that this was impossible. Why? Because in Job 9, in verses 5 to 6, he said, God is too powerful. I, I'm nothing. Uh, you know, verses 7 to 9, God is infinite. I'm so small. Uh, in verses 12 to 13, God can do whatever he wants to do. Nothing can stop him. So Job, at this point in time, was at a loss. He was asking, I want these things. I want vindication. But what can I do? And in verses 32 to 35, he said, you know, I, I may not be able to go to God. He is so infinite. I, I wish that God were a man so I could talk to him. I, I wish there was a mediator, someone who could come in between God and me, someone to bring us together because God seems so far away. So Job here was at a loss. His questions that he had asked were not answered. His friends were no friends. Job's responses are the natural responses of a hurt and a suffering man. You know, the Bible does not whitewash 
his struggles. Um, it, it doesn't. You know, it's, it's raw. It's ugly. And this is what we are. But what's amazing, what's amazing is that despite these nine punches he had received, and of course many more punches, despite his hurt, despite his confusion, despite the pressure to buckle, to make a, you know, a dishonest confession, what is remarkable about Job is that he did not cave in. He didn't give up. So yes, while we saw the wounds of a down man, he was hurt, he was lost. But here we see thirdly, his confident perseverance. While Job was hurt and lost, he fought back. He rebuked his friends. You know, Zophar had said, Job, you're wrong. Job responded, and he said, no, Zophar, you are wrong. All right, in Job 12, 1 to 6, you know, essentially Job says here, you know, you three, you people think you know everything, don't you? You think wisdom lives and dies with you. Well, I have understanding too. You're not smarter than I am. You mock me because I ask God for an answer. You kick me when I'm down. But I tell you, you are wrong. The wicked are not always punished. Robbers get away with their crimes. Sinners even prosper. You see, Job knew his theology. He was fighting against that traditional karma theology. You know, whatever his friends had said, granted, not everything that they said was untrue, but very often the crux of the matter, the things that they said were not true. You know, they said the innocent never suffer. The, the innocent suffer every day. Oh, the wicked never get away with their crimes. They're always punished. No, the wicked do get away with their crimes. God doesn't always punish evildoers now. So Job was trying to show that life is not so simple. Their accusations were not accurate. You know, it, it is very comforting to have a very black and white world. And that's why, you know, pardon this, you know, Christian fundamentalism is so attractive. You know, girls who don't wear long skirts and, you know, bonnets in their hair and, you know, uh, don't wear uh, makeup, they're holy. You know, and, and, and men who do this are, are holy. It, it's very nice to have a very fundamentalist, black and white cultural kind of Christianity. But it's not so simple. You know, suffering does come on the innocent. Right? The, the innocent do suffer. But what Job's friends were unable to see were these nuances in life. They wanted to have a very black and white world. And furthermore, they accused Job of being ignorant. You know, Job had to respond to, to them by saying, no, you're the ignorant ones. In Job 13, verse 4, he called them forgers of lies. Now, the word forgers means to smear. It means to plaster or to whitewash. I mean, if you have a nick in your wall, you know, uh, maybe your kid went to dig a hole in the wall, you'll have to find some putty and just to, you know, uh, plaster it there and paint it over. So, in other words, he was accusing them of having theology that was full of holes, that they needed to plug up the holes with untruth. And in verses 5 to 13 of chapter 13, he takes the offensive. While they told him, you be quiet, you listen to us, now he tells them, no, 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 you be quiet and you listen to me. Verse 5, he says, it's better for you to remain silent. Why? Verse 7, because your words are wrong. Verse 12, it's because your words are worthless as the burnt garbage that I sit on and as worthless as the clay pot that I'm using to scrape myself. Verse 13, so you be quiet. Stop talking. Leave me alone. I reject your judgment. I will appeal directly to God. This is what Job was saying here. 
So it's a remarkable change from a man who was hurt, a man who was down, a man who had all of these punches. And now here in chapter 13, he's taking the offensive. He is not giving up so easily. You know, it's, it's like we're watching some kung fu movie. The hero that has been punched, that is almost knocked out, suddenly he gets up, he starts to fight back, he starts using some kind of special, you know, new fighting style, and we cry, yes! You know, Job's here, Job has had it. You know, he, 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 he got up and he rebuked them because their theology was wrong. Their judgment was shallow. But more than just fighting back, Job's triumph was his trust in God. You know, this was a man that was repeatedly told, you're wicked, that's why you suffer, so you must repent. Job said, no, I'm a sinner, but I haven't done, you know, sins that have been so bad in order to, um, you know, receive these kinds of punishment. And in the midst of that, while Job did often say, you know, God, are you unfair? Come down, speak to me. I want to make my point. I want to defend myself to you. I want you to, to, to vindicate me. Yes, Job had those moments. But in the middle of all this, he still trusted in God's judgment alone. In verse 15 of chapter 13, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I will defend myself before him. And this is remarkable. Even though God slays me, I will still trust in him. Although Job knew that his sufferings came from God, even though he didn't understand why they came on him, even though he thought it was unfair that it came on him, yet he still trusted God. You know, in this scenario here, there was an unfair fight. But it's clear that Job was still fighting. He was beaten down with nine punches and beaten subsequently to this with more punches. But Job was still fighting. You know, he, he was fighting against bad wisdom, but he was fighting to trust God in the midst of all of this. You know, for many of us, like I said before, we are like Job's wife. Why are you holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. But we ought to be like Job, to fight, to trust in God. Even though we don't understand, even though we've asked God and he's not answered, we need to fight to trust in God. You see, dear friends, here, the application can be as simple as, as we look at the story, and this is an application that's often made, you know, it's not wrong, but, you know, people say, the application here to Christians is, we need to be patient and kind to others in their suffering. Yes, it's true, but what we need to realize is that we are more like Job's friends than we care to admit you know, at heart, we are like Pharisees. We are black and white cultural fundamentalists. You know, this is right, that's wrong. You know, and, and I'm not talking about the laws of God. You know, those are very clear. But, you know, we all have our sense of righteous justice and the consequences that people should receive if they do bad or they do evil. You know, we, we are people, who, when we see others struggling, we will say, you know, practice what you preach. It's kind of like Jesus. When he was on the cross, what did people say to him? What did they shout to him? They shouted, practice what you preach. Physician, heal thyself. He saved others. Let him save himself. You know, and, and, and what did they say of Christ? You know, they, they, they said that he was guilty. They made up crimes for him. They, they were false witnesses. He was sentenced to suffer. You know, we need to realize, however, that we are more like Job's friends than Job that we like to, that, that we care to admit, because it was our sins that put Christ there. We are Pharisees. We are traditional people with bad theology, you know, who believe in karma. But we've been rescued from there, from that as well, you know. And we we as we look at this, we see that his friends were no friends. 
And this brings us back to the time when Christ was at the Garden of Gethsemane. He told his disciples, watch and pray. He told them that my my soul is sorrowful unto death. But they could not even support him. They could not even pray for him. They would not even stay up to support him. And when he was at his greatest need, Peter denied him. And in his great pain, Jesus in frustration cried out. You know, we know what he cried out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason for that is Jesus was in an unfair fight. But he willingly endured the punches of the soldiers. So, you know, we can make simple applications that we have to be patient with one another and to, you know, to be to to help people in their suffering, but very often we are like Job's friends. Our sins put Christ on the cross. If we had been there with Christ at the Garden of Gethsemane, we would have betrayed him as well. We would have ignored him. We would not have stayed up to pray with him. But the great application here is that Jesus died to save us from a judgment from a righteous God. If anyone should be punished for not practicing what we preach, it is all of us. But Jesus took away our sins, that we may never again be sanctimonious, holier than thou, that we would not be traditional or self-righteous or vicious. It's not just that we should be nice, you know, uh, it, it's, it has to be more than that, that we should no longer be vicious because this is no longer in our renewed nature. And this is something we ought to fight. You know, it's not only sinful to think like they did, but these thoughts should not come naturally to us anymore. And not just that. If Job, before Christ, and before the full revelation of Scripture, fought for hope in his hurt. If he still trusted in God, even though he suffered in the will of God, then for us, we need to fight in difficult times. Again, we don't whitewash the Bible. We admit that saints go through very difficult times, and sometimes they wish for death. Now, it's not nice to say that many people have wished for death. But, you know, and I would hazard a guess, I've read it before, that even psychiatrists say that, you know, everyone has thought of death at one point in their lives, taking their life. You know, it's sinful, yes. It happens. You know, we are, we are sinful people. We, we do struggle. But we need to fight fight for hope as people who are redeemed. You know, even as Jesus' soul was sorrowful unto death, even though he had sweat great drops of blood, and yet he willingly took the cup of God's wrath to be forsaken so that nothing, absolutely nothing, not even death or life or or principalities or powers or, you know, a failed test or life of singleness or, 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 or a loss of a loved one, or poverty, or illness, or abandonment can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so we ought to press on because of what Jesus has done. And Jesus pressed on because he trusted in God. It was for the joy that was set before him that he pressed on. And, and so for us, Yes, we need to be kind and generous to those who suffer. But more than all of that, Jesus has died so that we would not think and react the way they would, but that we should persevere because there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And he was that human who came down, God as human, to be a mediator between God and man. And we should have hope because it's no longer an unfair fight. Well, it's still an unfair fight, but the odds are in our favor because we are on a tag team with a mighty friend 
who has fought for us, who will continue to fight for us, who hears and comforts us. And so even as we look at this passage and as we consider you know, what the Lord wants us to learn from this, let us remember Christ, that while it was an unfair fight before, we have Him on our side. We are victors. Though we feel sad, He understands us while others don't. And we can press on because He pressed on for us and He helps us. So may that be an encouragement even as we go through difficult times, as we go through this week. Maybe there are difficult, difficult times in family, at work, at church. Remember that Christ is on your side because He has redeemed you. Only trust in Him. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, yes, Lord, we are like Job's friends who are not friends. And we can often make unwise judgments and rebukes that are not biblical. Help us, O oh Lord, to see that we have a friend in Jesus and that he cares for us and that he helps us in all of our needs. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal more truth to us from your word as we reflect on it throughout the week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.